Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jamil Siddiqui, and I will be with you tonight working on some AP Calculus. We're going to be talking about integration techniques required for the AB Calculus exam. Uh, if you're out there and you're able to hear me all right, if you could just give me a, a thumbs up or a, a note in the chat, I'd appreciate that. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about the different types of integration that the AB Calculus exam uh, requires you to know. So, plus I think five of them on all the various social media sites so that you can be up to the uh, up to date with all of our, our events and what's happening. So, tonight we'll be looking at um, integrating using the basic integration formulas, uh, using some, some common algebra techniques to help us integrate, using some metric simplifications to help us integrate, and then integration by substitution. So, what I'd like to do this evening is go straight to some problems and start taking a look at some of the different techniques that we need to uh, be familiar with. So, if you give me a moment while I switch over. Uh, my tablet. So, we're going to be looking at uh, doing a bunch of different angles this evening and how uh, we should approach them on the AP exam to make sure that we're able to handle it. So, the first interval that we're looking at, um, it, it's, um, it's just right out of AP calculus. What I like to do with my students is I like to get them familiar, first of all, with the basic things that I know. So, so, I guess before we get started, what I'd like to do is just take a look and remind you of the basic integrals that every AD calculus student is supposed to be familiar with. So, we're talking about the integral of u to the n to u. So, if we've got a variable raised to a power. Okay, and uh, I usually use you when I use my students. The variable can be x just as easily. It doesn't really make a difference with the variable as long as the differential and the variable match in the other end. So the integral of u to the n to u, you should know, is u to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c. Okay, the next six integrals you should be familiar with are trigonometric functions. So the integral of sine x dx, which over the x variable now. That's equal to negative cosine x plus c. The integral of cosine x dx would be equal to sine x plus c. The integral of the secant squared x dx would be equal to the tangent x plus c. The integral of secant x tangent x dx would be equal to the secant x plus c. The integral of the cosecant x cotangent x dx is equal to the negative cosecant x plus c. The integral of the cosecant squared x dx is equal to the negative cotangent x plus c. So there are your six trigonometric functions you should be familiar with. Uh, the next three we're going to talk about are uh, exponential and logarithmic. So we should know the integral of e to the x, is dx is equal to e to the x plus c. You should be familiar with the integral of a to the x dx, which is any constant. A would be a to the x over the natural log of a plus c. And then the integral of 1 over x dx is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. So that's so the exciting term now to 10. Um, there are three other integrals that come up on the AB exam that you should be familiar with. And that's 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, which is the arc tangent of x plus c. You might be to that as an inverse tangent, written like this, so that's fine. Okay. Uh, the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. And that's the that's arc, arc sine of x plus c, c. and 1 over x, x times the square root of x squared minus 1 dx, dx. and that's the arc, arc, arc secant c x plus c. c. So these are the, the, the basic integrals uh, you're responsible for the AB calculus exam. Our, our job is to integrate it really, really, really make our integrals look like one of these 13. These are really the only 13 integrals that we're going to know how to do. So everything else is just manipulation. Try to get the integrals to look precisely like one of these 13. 
So, so we're going to go we're gonna go look at it, look at it. Uh, one of the points of the study. And the idea is he is to take these ideas and turn them into one of those three new digital resources. So, so the ground work around my students, what I always like to say is, First of all, first of all, does this is exactly the exact exact thing that he first posted out. Actually, March 13, he's going to integrate it with the edge that I just showed you. Show. The trick is going to be that you have to try to knock them out of the way that they're going to be 13 years old and they're going to be soft. So, how do we manipulate them to be the 13? So, in this first example, I'm going to ask the question, why does Y13 and the answer is no, no, it doesn't be exact, exact. So the second thing I think is always what my students do is ask is, is there any algebra or trigonometric simplification that we can do that will make this match up to those 13 in a more direct, direct way? This is one of the common things that algebra tells me to see on the exam. Look at this, which is first notice the fraction actually got turned to the so, so what I would I would ask students to think about is if you got a fraction fraction or a reason where you're greater. Basically, it's half to half. Someone has taken multiple fraction fractions, found the found the globe, and all that, and add them all together. So if we were to take this example, example, and we were to reconstruct it with three terms of the numerator, where it really says is this is the same as having three fractions you got together. The common denominator is x. So now now we separate this. By keeping the terms are top topics, the fourth star is dark, the square is next one, next one, two, and last, last one. What we can do is we can break apart this fraction, fraction and, and we can we can split, split it into, into seven, seven terms. terms. Now, at now, first, I thought it was something like that big deal, deal, deal. But, but once you start looking at it closely, each term now is 77. So our first term term ends up being x cubed. Our second second term ends up being b x. And our third term, term, I'm going to leave those two x for x for now. So now, so now, now if you're going to be in the rules of iteration, we're actually about to go to go to try to find term. So, so the first first term, and I'm going to take this next step to show you. We get up, 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 But the idea here is that this can now be now be separate, separate, separate intervals. Where this is, this is the next one, next one, next one, Plus the other one of three x three x dx plus the other one of two two x dx and just kind of just one step further. You probably probably familiar with the idea that any any constant back that actually gets pulled up pulled up front front. So I'm just pulled up pulled up for the other that interval and I'll and I'll two two it's the next the next interval. And now I have this expression. expression. I have now got this expression to those 13 rows and rows that we saw. We saw the x and the x and the x and the x and So, so, so in an integral of x cubed x cubed v x. Just doing that out, that out, he's going to x four, 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 plus c, c. Next to what we have is three, three, x, d, x, d, x. Well, remember, remember, this is really six, x first, first. So that's going to be x squared, squared, two, two. And that and that's the fact that we just put our red red answer answer. So so this is going to be the second term. second term, and then and then we'll third we'll third, third one is going to be the other one. One of x x d x. Well well again again for x for x is just one of those that we just don't know. That matches matches that. Of the absolute value value of x. We've got we've got two on the front. It's a free ride free answer answer. And then two that we got we got constant. So this is this is the individual visuals here. So we have to get the final answer and sum all of these. So the final answer is x next to the four and four and four plus plus three x three x two two plus two two times the thousand thousand times x. And now now we really got really got we've got one constant plus another another plus a third third. Well well. You could write and write these seven responses, but taking three responses, you got to do that. You're just going to end up with the right response anyway. So I'd like to just write a final final C plus C at the end, and that would be the final answer for this one. So so the idea here is going to be taking a fraction by using common denominators. We do something out and out of this as split fraction. Okay. Okay. So so the idea again, if you've got got terms in a fraction. Can you, can you teach each term separately, separately or the common denominator, and then simplify that? 
Great common common idea of the of the exam but that one that you can see here so also that makes sense to you eight point 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 eight
So at this point in time, um, we're going to continue with this process. And as we keep going, what we're going to find out is that we want to now bring down this positive 4. And again, we're asking, how do we take out that positive 2x in the beginning? What do we have to multiply this x by? And it's going to be plus 2. So when we multiply this by plus 2, we get 2x minus 4. And now again, just being really careful about changing the signs each step along the way. Uh, we're going to end up with a negative 2x, a positive 4 here, and add these together. That's going to eliminate our 2x's, and that's going to leave us with a remainder of 8. Now, what you want to think about is, how do I write that remainder? And if you remember from your days of, like I said, uh, long division, it's going to be 8, and then it's going to be over our x minus 2. So, what this has done for us is... We have now found a new way to rewrite um, to rewrite this expression. So our original integral can now be rewritten as the integral of our quotient. So it's going to be x squared plus 4x plus 2 plus 8 over x minus 2. From here... We can just kind of start by asking, okay, let's look at this term by term. Can we figure how to integrate this just going one term at a time? And the first one is going to be the integral of x squared. I'm just going to write these all individually again. Plus the integral, 4 gets a free row in the front. And then the integral of 2dx. And then the last one is going to be the integral of 8 over x minus 2. And we'll do that one separately. That's going to be a little more challenging than the other ones. But the first three line up to match up to our, our integrals that we just know. They're all x to the n. So this one's going to be x cubed over 3. The next one, that x is going to be x squared over 2. But we're going to give that 4 a free ride to the answer. The next one, we're going to integrate 2. We're going to get 2x. So now, really, the only question is how do we integrate this 8 over x minus 2? Um, 8 actually ends up getting that constant ride to the, to the answer. So really what we're thinking about doing is integrating 1 over x minus 2 dx. And that's going to end up being the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 2. And I'm going to be a little more specific about that um, as we look at some of the other examples. So... The idea here is to use long division to help you out. So long division um, is the key to, to getting this problem to, to match up to an integral that you um, can recognize and, and do it fairly straightforwardly. So the next one I want to look at is this integral. Um, Notice I just left out a uh, piece of what we're going to talk about this way, then we're going to compare and contrast it. So in this one, if you ask, is this one that I know automatically, the answer is, is no. It doesn't match up perfectly because it's factors. Okay? It has to be terms if we're going to do it step by step. So you might say, is there any algebra we can do in this one? And this one's actually fairly straightforward. All we need to do is distribute this. And if we distribute this example, we'll turn in the integral of x to the fifth plus 4x squared dx. And now we can actually do those term by term, and that would give us x to the 6 over 6. This would be 4 to get the free ride to the answer. It would be 4x cubed over 3, and then we'd add our constant on that. So just distributing this one would, would take care of it. But what I really want to do is I want to look at a slight variation of this problem. And what would happen if I raise this factor to the 10th power? Okay. Once I take that to the 10th power, um, at this point in time, what we've got to do is we've got to figure out how we're going to integrate this and make this look like one of the uh, integrals that, that we're familiar with. So in order to do that, that brings up the idea of U substitution. So I hope you guys have seen U substitution already. Um, I'm going to give you my, my spiel on, on how U substitution works, and I hope it's going to make sense to you. Uh, but what I talk about is basically what we've got to do is we've got to rewrite this in terms of another variable so it looks more like a u to the n type problem. So the idea is we're going to choose something in our integrand and we're going to choose it as u. Now, 
if you're familiar with the chain rule of, of, of differentiation, u substitution is actually very closely related to the chain rule. And the, the rule that I always tell my students is that when you're trying to choose your value for u, the inside function is your best bet. Okay, so when you're looking at this, what you want to do is you want to think about what is the inside function in our expression. And that usually means locating the parentheses and then trying to find out how to handle the inside of those parentheses. So in this case, we've got x cubed plus 4 on the inside. So that would be my, my suggestion for your first choice for you. Um, from there, the next step of u substitution is actually differentiating both sides of this equation. And that would get you that du over dx equals 3x squared. And then to go one step further, we're going to multiply both sides by dx to get us du equals 3x squared dx. This is going to be the key to trying to bring this uh, to a u um, integral, okay? So what I tell my students now is it's, it, it's all about bookkeeping. It's about keeping things organized, making sure you don't leave anything behind. So the rules that I like to give them are the following. I like to say that if you're a function or you're a constant, you can transfer over very, very easily. If you are an x, you're not going to be allowed to come into our new integral. We're trying to rewrite our integral in terms of u. So here goes the bookkeeping. Um, what I like to say is I want to start by taking this integral symbol. And because the integral symbol is an example of a function, no problem with that. I can bring that right in. Okay. The next thing I usually like to bring over is the easiest function I can find. And in this case, that's something raised to the 10th power. So I can bring that over as something raised to the 10th. And I'm kind of checking everything off as I bring it over. The next thing I want to bring over is usually going to be that inside function that we chose. So in this case, that's x cubed plus 4. I can't have x's in my new integral. So what I need to do instead is bring my x's into this box. And by bringing it into the box, what I can do is I can um, re re rewrite it using u instead. So the idea is to rewrite our entire x integral in terms of u. So we bring this into the box as x cubed plus 4. But if you look in the box, we see that x cubed plus 4 is exactly u. So it enters the box as x cubed plus 4, but it's going to leave the box as u. Right now, at this point in time, we've got to now think about how are we going to bring over the remaining pieces. And in this case, the remaining pieces come down to x squared and dx. Okay? So we've got x squared, we've got dx left. How can we rewrite this in terms of u? But again, the whole idea is to go into what I've got calling in this box here and try to find out how x squared dx relates to u. So if you look in the box, what you're going to find is you're going to get this expression right here. Okay? And that expression right there already has an x squared dx in it. So from there, what you're going to want to do is say, okay, let's isolate the x squared dx. And if we isolate the x squared dx, what we're going to end up with is one-third du. Because of that, we now can say that x squared dx can be rewritten as one-third du. And now we're going to bring one-third du in in place of the x squared dx. At that point in time, every piece of our integral is accounted for. So we basically got a brand new function, a brand new integral over in U world. And the question now is, is it one that we're supposed to know? So if I clean this up, what we're really left with is the integral of U to the 10th DU with that constant one third out in the front. Okay. Since we've got a constant one third out in the front, that doesn't really affect the problem at all. So we can integrate the U to the 10th DU using our rule of u to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, which gives us u to the 11th over 11. And now the 1 third comes along, which means what we've really got for an answer now is 1 over 33 u to the 11th. But because this question was asked in terms of x's, we really need to answer it back in terms of x's. So we've got to go through the process again of transferring this back to uh, away from our u variable into our x variable. 
So the first thing we're going to bring back is that 1 over 33. Again, that's a constant, so we can bring this back no problem. Then what we've got is this something raised to the 11th. That is a function, so I can bring that back no problem. And then the only thing left to bring back is this U value. So again, I've got my box set up. I like looking at the box and, and bringing everything back and forth because that's kind of where my bookkeeping takes place. If I go back to the box with just a U, I am reminded that U is equal to X cubed plus 4. So I can now replace that here with X cubed plus 4. And then the last thing you've always got to remember on any indefinite integral, you need to have a plus C. So our final answer is given by 1 33rd X cubed plus 4 quantity 11th plus C. Okay, so hopefully you've seen U substitution already at this point in the year. And uh, this is just a refresher, just a kind of a reminder of how U substitution is going to work for you. Uh, the next integral I want to look at is the integral of x squared sine x cubed dx. What I'd like to do is just point out the fact that this is going to be, uh, it, it doesn't match perfectly to one of the 13 we're supposed to know. In terms of any kind of algebra we can do to manipulate this, there's, there's really not a lot going on here. So this is actually be a U substitution problem. If we think about who the inside function would be here, we're really asking kind of what's the inside of this sine function. And the parentheses can always be written around that angle. So you can go with U equals X cubed. And then from there, we would differentiate to find out that DU is equal to 3X squared DX. What I'd like to do now is just give you guys about one minute or so to see if you can bring this over, rewrite it in terms of U, and then complete this integral. So I'm just going to give you like a, a minute or 90 seconds to see if you can do that, and then we're going to compare answers after you've had a chance to work on it. Um, so again, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this process of bookkeeping and just make sure that everything is accounted for. So we want to make sure we bring the integral over because that's going to be a piece that we need. The next thing I want to bring over is the sine because that's a function, and we can bring that right in. The next thing I want to make sure that we have accounted for is our x cubed. But because that's an x, I kind of have to look at my bookkeeping and figure out how it can transfer from uh, an x integral to a u integral. But we've said that u is going to be equal to x cubed. So it enters as x cubed, but it's going to leave as u. And now the next piece is really the piece that is, is the part you've got to be careful about. It's making sure that the leftover pieces, which in this case are x squared dx, how do you bring those over? Well, again, you're looking to see if you can bring them over ba uh, based, in, based on you. So if we look here again and we start looking at this and we're asking, is there an x squared dx in there somewhere? You're going to locate x squared dx right here. So all we really have to do is just solve this equation for x squared dx. And we're going to find out one third du is equal to x squared dx. So we're going to bring in the x squared dx, and it's going to leave as one-third du. du at the end, one-third on the front. And now when we ask, is this one of the integrals that we're supposed to be familiar with? The answer is yes. So the integral of sine of u du is going to be negative cosine u. And we've got to remember that one-third. So let's just put that in the front. And now the, our, our answer turns into negative one-third cosine u. From here, we've got to bring it back and write it in terms of x. The negative one-third is a constant, so that's free just to come back. The cosine of something is a function, so that's free to come over. And now we need to replace that u, but by looking in the box, we see that u is equal to x cubed. So we're going to replace it with x cubed, and then always plus c for the end of our indefinite integral. So this answer, again, is being done by u substitution. Okay. Here's another problem. This is uh, when we're going to look at. Uh, it's tangent squared x dx. Again, I just want to kind of give you a moment to think about it. So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, 45 seconds to think about it. And we're going to talk about the approach on how we would integrate tangent squared x dx. So in this problem, we're going to start again. You're going to say, does this match up to one of those 13 problems that I showed you at the beginning of the stream? And tangent squared is nowhere on that list. So what you've got to think about now is, is there any algebra I can do or is there any trigonometry I can do? And Hopefully, what you remember from your days of pre-calculus is that if you've got a trig function being squared, there's a variety of identities that you can start to think about. So the most common of these identities is sine squared x plus cosine squared x 
equals one, and they're usually referred to as the Pythagorean identities because of their resemblance to the Pythagorean theorem. Um, every trig function has a Pythagorean identity. So the most common one people remember is the one for sine and cosine, but you can very easily, easily manipulate this one into getting one for tangent. So if you recall, tangent squared is equal to sine squared over cosine squared. So what I would suggest is what would happen if we took this identity that we just wrote and just divided everything by cosine squared? So we'd be taking an equation that we know is true and then just doing the same thing to both sides, which we know is legal. We would end up with sine squared over cosine squared, which is in fact tangent squared. Now we have a term of cosine squared over cosine squared, which is one. And that is equal to one over cosine squared which is equal to the secant squared. So what we end up with here is a new way of thinking about tangent squared, because this can be manipulated to solve for tangent squared. And if we do that, we get tangent squared equals secant squared x minus 1. And now that gives us some options, because if we don't want to integrate tangent squared x dx, we can now rewrite this integrand as secant squared x minus 1. There are some big advantages to doing that. Namely, I can now split this into two separate integrals. And the integral of secant squared x dx and the minus the integral of 1 dx. And secant squared is actually one of those 13 integrals that we're supposed to know. So you should be familiar with the integral of secant squared. As soon as you see that, you're supposed to know that the integral of secant squared is tangent x. And now we're going to subtract the integral of 1 dx. That's going to be minus x. And then, of course, we're going to need a plus C for our indefinite integral at the end. So in this example, using a trigonometric identity is really what's going to save us and, and allow us to integrate. Um, just real quickly, what you see here is the Pythagorean identity for sine and cosine. Here's the Pythagorean identity for tangent and secant. You can find the other Pythagorean identity for cotangent and cosecant by starting with your sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. And this time, instead of dividing by uh, cosine squared, divide everything by, I'm sorry, divide everything by sine squared this time. And we end up with one plus cotangent squared x equals cosecant squared x. And just like in the tangent squared problem, Tangent squared does not have an easy integral directly, but secant squared does. If you're ever trying to integrate cotangent squared, again, not a straightforward identity, not straightforward integral, but cosecant squared does have a straightforward integral. So it's a good trade for you to make. Uh, this next example I want to show you is the integral of sine root x over root x dx. Um, this is not one that we're supposed to know off the top of our head. This is not one that has any algebra or trigonometry available to us to manipulate. So this is one where we're going to want to do a U substitution again. So we're going to want to find our U. Trying to figure out how the inside function relates to this problem, it's always helpful for me to remember that you can put parentheses around the angle of any trigonometric function. So if you're ever working with an integral and you've got a trigonometric function, putting parentheses around the angle is going to help you identify the inside function. So in this case, we're going to go with u equals the square root of x. If we now go and differentiate this, we're going to get du over dx equals 1 over 2 root x. And from there, we're going to end up with du equals 1 over 2 root x dx. So now we know how to basically convert x's to u's. So we're going to do our bookkeeping again. We're going to say, okay, let's make sure we lose any of the pieces. Let's bring over the integral sign first. When we bring that over, we're now going to try to take over the sign next. So that's going to be the sign of something. The next, uh, the next piece we're going to bring over is that inside piece. That's going to be root x. But you're going to have to take that root x and look at your conversions. Root x is going to come over as u. And now this is kind of an interesting problem because you've really got two pieces left over. You've got um, 1 over root x and dx left over. 
and you want to ask yourself, what's the most efficient way to bring this over? You might say, well, I already know that I can replace root X with U, and I can just bring that over. But to me, in this problem, there's actually a more efficient way of doing it. Because if I go and I look for this expression, 1 over root X dx, I actually see it right here. So that means I can actually solve for 1 over root X dx right there by multiplying both sides of this equation by 2. And I get 2 du equals 1 over root X dx. So at this point in time, when I want to bring over 1 over root X dx, it can now come over as 2 du. I put the 2 in front, the du at the end. And now this is one of those 13 integrals that we're supposed to be familiar with in, in AB calculus. So the integral of sine u du ends up being negative cosine u. We've got a constant factor of 2 that we need to bring in. So this is actually negative 2 cosine u. When we go to bring this back in terms of x, the negative 2 comes over. The cosine of the angle comes like this. And now we've just got to replace that u with root x. And when we get root x, we get negative 2 cosine root x. And then we've got to add plus c. Okay? So that is how I would handle this. I see uh, Bofu is, is asking a question, why don't we just multiply by 1 half? Uh, I'm assuming you mean back where I had the 1 over root x dx left over. If I did that, I could multiply that by 1 half, but I'd also have to put a 2 out in the front to balance it. Algebraically, it ends up being the exact same thing. So if you've been working on new substitution problems this year and your way of getting this to balance is to multiply by that factor to make it match perfectly, by all means, continue to do so. Okay, It's another way of doing the u-substitution. Algebraically, it's equivalent. I'm solving for what I, what I need directly. Uh, multiplying it by one half is just a way to make it match perfectly. But if you multiply by that one half, again, I just want to stress, if you're going to multiply by that one half right here, you need to balance it by multiplying by a 2 on the outside so that you don't change the, the, the value of the integral. So if that's what you're asking, and uh, I, th I think it is, you're in good shape. Just make sure you balance that equation the same way. Okay? Um, the next integral I want to look at is 1 over x squared plus 4. Okay? Now, when we look at this one, the first question that I always like to ask is, is this one of the 13 that I'm supposed to know? And it looks a lot like one of the 13 we're supposed to be familiar with. If you don't remember from our, our first page tonight, there is an integral that says 1 over x squared plus 1 dx is equal to arctangent of x plus c. So this integral looks very much like that arctangent integral. Okay? But you can't be close. You have to be exactly the same. So we're going to run into a problem with this one because I've got a 4 here, and we need to have a 1. So that's really going to be the hang-up. So the question that we need to ask is, how can we turn that 4 into a 1 and still get this to kind of match up? Because we've got a pretty good feeling arctan is going to be involved in this problem. So this is, this is an algebra example to start with. And the first thing you want to do is you just want to take this 4 and you want to turn it into a 1, you're going to do it in somewhat of an unconventional way. You're going to factor out a 4. And I know what you're saying. I can take a 4 out of the 4. That's going to leave a plus 1 right there. But can I take a 4 out of this x squared and still have it work? And the answer to that question is, you, yeah, of course you can. You just have to make sure it balances. So the way I like to think of this, instead of saying, you know, does 4 go into x squared? I think that's how a lot of people approach it. I like to ask, what do I have to put here, you know, in this spot right here, so that when I multiply it by 4, I get x squared? And the only thing that will work is x squared over 4, which it kind of looks a little bit, you know, ugly as an algebraic statement but it succeeds in getting us that plus one. And what you're going to find out is in those inverse trig integrals, making sure you have that one in the right place for arctan, for arc sine, and for arc secant is the most important part to getting that integral to match. So as long as you agree that factoring out a four this way works by using x squared over four plus one, you can now say, okay, that four in the bottom is really a one-fourth, and that's a constant I can pull the outside. 
And now you can write this as 1 over x squared plus 4 plus 1 dx. And now you're probably saying, well, wait a minute. I got the 1, but now I don't have the x squared. Because remember, that integral has an x squared plus 1 of the bottom. Well, this is where I want to remind you about how u substitution works again. Another way to write this integral is as 1 over u squared plus 1 du. And that would equal the arc tangent of u plus c. So now, can we take advantage of a u substitution? Because if these guys are to match, all that means is u squared has to match to x squared plus 4. If those are the same, everything else here matches perfectly. So in this example, what I would suggest to you is I would suggest starting by thinking about what does it mean if u squared and x squared over 4 are the same? Well, if I take the square root of both sides, what that really means is that u is going to equal x over 2. If u equals x over 2 and I take the derivative, du over dx is going to equal 1 half, which means that du equals 1 half dx. Using this now as my substitution, I can now try to take and bring my integral in terms of x and change it to terms of u. So I'm going to try to do my bookkeeping on this, make sure everything matches. One-fourth is a constant. I can just bring that over. The integral symbol is a function. I can just bring that right over. I've got my one over. Again, those are functions and constants, so I can just bring those right over. I've got my plus 1, again, a function and a constant there. Just bring that right over. And now the only thing left to bring over is this idea of x squared over 4. But if I look in my box over here, I know what x squared over 4 is supposed to match up to. x squared over 4 is supposed to match up to u squared. And now the only thing left to bring over is my dx. But if I go in the box, what I'll find right here on this bottom equation, if I ice dx, I'm going to get that dx is equal to 2 du. So I can bring dx over, put a 2 in the front as a constant, put a du at the end, and all of a sudden I've now got an integral of 1 half the integral of 1 over u squared plus 1 du. And that is precisely one of the 13 integrals that we're supposed to be familiar with. So I know this has an answer of 1 half arctangent u. So when I bring this back and rewrite this in terms of x, I get 1 half arctangent of, well, I want to use u, but u has a value of x over 2. And then I remember my constant of integration at the end. So when you're dealing with, and let me just pull up those integrals again. When you're dealing with these three integrals right here, okay, these last three, okay, it is incredibly important that you have these ones in the right place. If those are not ones, these integrals don't match, and you won't be able to use these integration rules. So if you're coming and you're integrating and you're seeing an example that reminds you of the inverse trig integrals like this one does, the key is turning the constant on the bottom, in this case a 4, into a 1. But whatever that constant is, you're going to try to factor that out and turn that into a 1. Um, all right, so let's take a look at this integral. Uh, this is the integral of 1 over x squared plus 8x plus 17 dx. If we look at this, it doesn't match perfectly to any of our 13 integrals. Uh, if we think about doing any algebra here, the algebra involved in this one is not obvious at all. And if you try thinking about u sub, it's hard to find an inside function to choose for you. So really, this is one of those integrals where uh, there are problems that I, I've come across in mathematics that I say to myself, I never would have thought to do that. But after someone showed me it, it makes so much sense. I, I kind of try to remember. And I feel this problem is, is, is one of those. So this is an algebra problem that we're going to need to do. And what I want to do is I just want to focus on the denominator for a second. X squared plus 8X minus seven, uh, plus 17. What I want to do is I want to try to factor this, but... It doesn't work nicely with the 17 at the end. So what you really need to do is you need to go back to your Algebra 2 information and think about when you were graphing quadratics, ironically enough. Uh, 
we know if we just forgot about calculus for a second, we just looked at this as its own expression, we would recognize this as a parabola. And somewhere in algebra two, or maybe even pre-calculus, you said, I need to find the vertex of that parabola. And if you did it the long way, what that meant was completing the square. So what I want to do is just give you a real quick reminder on how completing the square works. Completing the square is all about x squared and plus 8x in this case, and then saying, what is the number that goes here so that I could factor this into a perfect square, you know, something squared? So if you think about this for a little while, the number you're looking for is 16. If, if we put a 16 there, this is going to be x plus 4 quantity squared. So how do we use this idea to help us with this integral? Um, x squared plus 8x plus, and again, I, I'm going to kind of set this up. We need to find the mystery number that goes here. So what I always tell my students is just push that 17 over. Just push them out of the way. Forget about them. We're going to find that mystery number there that creates a perfect square. And then we're going to balance it by subtracting the same number over here because we can't change the value of our expression. So you may remember from your days of, of, of Algebra 2 that the mystery factor is, uh, the mystery term is always equal to b over 2 quantity squared. And in this case, 8 is our value of b. So we're looking for 8 divided by 2, which is 4. If we square that, we get 16. That is the mystery number that goes here. But to keep balance in this equation, if I add 16 here, I've got to subtract 16 just down the road. So this has not changed the value of our expression at all. But what it's done is it's changed the way we can write it. We can now write it as x squared plus 8x plus 16. And then 17 minus 16 becomes a plus 1 over here. Now, you might think to yourself, well, that's that's nice. But why? why, why, why? Isn't writing plus 17 a simpler form? Well, normally it is, but not when we're trying to integrate this thing. So if we rewrite this integral using that denominator that we just found completing the square, and I group this, and I just leave the plus 1 over, what I can now do is I can factor that grouping. So I'm going to get 1 over, and this part right here is a perfect square, so that's going to turn into x plus 4 quantity squared, and now we're going to have a plus 1, and now we're going to have a dx, and now you're going to think back about arctangent again. Because all of a sudden, this integral is reminding us a lot of 1 over u squared plus 1 du. So for these to match perfectly, that's going to mean that I've got to use u equal to x plus 4. And if u equals x plus 4, then du is equal to dx, and now I can use this to rewrite my original integral in terms of u. So, again, just doing my bookkeeping, the integral symbol is going to come. And let me just give myself a little more space here. Let's bring that up here for now. Okay. So that integral symbol is going to come in. This 1 over is going to come in. Now what I've got is this something squared coming in. And the plus 1 is going to come in, no problem. I've now got to figure a way to bring that x plus 4 over. But x plus 4 is exactly what I have as u. So it comes over as u. And now the only thing left to take care of is this dx. But if I look in my box, dx is the same as du. So I end up with my integral that is exactly the arctangent integral. So this ends up being an arctan of u. And now when I bring this back to rewrite it in terms of x's, I get the arctangent of the quantity u, which is really x plus 4. And then I've got to put my plus c for my, my uh, indefinite integral. So again, this idea of completing the square, it is not something that is obvious at all. But the clue that I tell my students is if you've got a degree 2 polynomial on the bottom, this can be done sometimes using complete the square. You've got to think about it. So if you don't make a concerted effort to remember this, 
this is one that's very easy. It could just go right over your head and you might not even notice it. So just kind of remember, every time you see an AX squared plus BX plus C in the denominator, can you complete the square to try to turn this into an arc tangent type problem? Those last two, very, very specific, but we have seen those on the AP exam over the last couple of years, two or three years. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something similar to it again this year. We probably have time for probably one more. Um, the one I want to look at right now is this one. Um, I just want to give you a minute to think about this on your own, and then we'll get back together and, and see where we go with this. So take a look, see what you think about it, and I'll be back in about a minute. Okay, on this particular integral, there's a lot going on here, okay? You've got three factors. Um, each individual factor doesn't look too difficult, but when you put them all together, that kind of kind of clumps it. It makes it a little more complicated. Um, if, if you try to match this to one of the 13 we're supposed to know, there is no match at all. So you're saying to yourself, what can I do in terms of algebra in this problem? And the algebra you need, again, it, it comes from algebra 2 again. Um, you may remember in algebra 2, if you had the square root of 12, you were taught you could simplify that by breaking that into the square root of 4 times the square root of 3, and then that would equal 2 root 3. Well, the important idea here is we think all the time about taking one square root and breaking it into two square roots. It's not often we think about taking two square roots and combining them to make one. And that's really the idea that's pivotal in this particular problem. What we want to do is we want to take those two square roots and we want to multiply them together. So by doing that, we're going to end up with an X on the outside. He's just kind of hanging around. We're not, we're not touching him. But we're going to multiply those square roots together. And just like what we did over here, we just multiply the insides together. 4 times 3 gave us this 12. On our problem, we're going to multiply X minus 1 times X plus 1. And that's a, you know, multiplying conjugates together to get a difference of squares. So that's going to give us X times the square root of X squared minus 1. Now, at first, this is not, you know, a, a, a simple problem still because this doesn't match one of our 13. But all of a sudden now, we have an inside function that's pretty obvious, okay? We've got an inside function of x squared minus 1. And when I see that, I'm starting to think about u substitution. So if I were to try u equals x squared minus 1 in this problem, what I would get is that we would end up with du is equal to 2x dx. And all of a sudden now, can I start changing my integral in terms of x and write it in terms of u? So the bookkeeping begins. I want to bring over my integral symbol first. I want to bring over this square root next, and that can just come in because it's a function. I want to bring over that inside function of x squared minus 1, but that has to come in through this way, and it's going to enter as u. So now what I've got is I've got a couple of spare parts left over. I've got my x and my dx. So I'm thinking again, how can I bring those over together? And what I'm seeing is I'm seeing my x dx right there. So I personally like to solve for that and find out that 1 half du is equal to x dx. So now when I bring x dx over, it's going to come over with a 1 half on the outside, and a du on the inside. And when I look at that integral again over there in terms of u, what I'm really seeing is the integral of u of the 1 half du. Well, this is a perfect match. This is one of the 13 we're supposed to know. So we integrate this by saying this is u to the 1 half plus 1 over 1 half plus 1 with a 1 half in the front. So we do our arithmetic here. What we end up with is u to the 3 halves this is going to be divided by 3 halves, so we're really going to be multiplying it by 2 thirds, and we still have a fraction of 1 half out there. So in terms of u, this is 1 third u to the 3 halves. When we take that answer and we bring it back and rewrite it in terms of x, what we end up with is 1 third my u, which I can't write because I've got to replace that, but it's going to be raised to the 3 halves, and then that value of u looking back up here, ends up being x squared minus 1. So now we just have to remember our plus c at the end, and this would be the answer um, to this, this integral. And the funny thing about this one is it's actually a combination. We had to do a little bit of algebra first to set it up so it would work as a u substitution. So again, just to kind of recap and, and, and just remind you, um, 
some of the things that we've seen. In our first example, the idea was something I referred to as split the fraction, okay? If you can break it up using common denominators and you can go term by term, very often those terms are simpler than just taking it on directly. So that's a, that's a nice algebra maneuver to remember. In the second one, and this is one that I feel is going to be more popular th th this year and the coming years, the AP people have said that they, they really want to stress this idea, but this idea of long division. So if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, can you use long division to go term by term? And the next one we saw, this idea of use substitution. And again, if you have an inside function, choose the inside function as the U, and then make sure that that, that works. In the following one, Again, this is another U substitution. We've got an inside function, and that inside function uh, is X cubed. In the next one, this is a trigonometric identity. If, if you see a squared trig function, then you can use your trigonometric identities, and you can rewrite that in terms of other squared functions. And just remember, when it comes to squared functions, the ones that we like the best for integrating are secant squared, and cosecant squared, because both of those have integrals that are direct. You can just integrate them immediately. Um, the last couple ones, just to remind you, again, this is kind of a hidden U substitution because you got to put the parentheses in to see the inside function on that one. And then the last two, very, very, very specialized problems. Okay, They're, they're not super frequent, but they, they have shown up on the AP exams. Trying to get your integrals to match to the inverse trig. And on this one, again, the idea was trying to get this guy right here to be a 1. How do we get that to be 1? And that meant factoring out the 4. So again, not super obvious. You wouldn't think about that immediately. But once you see it once or twice, hopefully it sticks, sticks in your head. And then the last one here is using complete the square in order to um, integrate and set this up as an inverse trig function again. So those are the, uh, the, the the tips and the tricks that I've got for you. I see someone there has asked, can I get a link to the PowerPoint for this one? All of these resources, the entire stream will be uh, cataloged on the Five of the website. If you have an account and you log in there, you can get access to this 24-7 starting tomorrow. So that is the best way I can get you uh, the, the replay and the slides from this evening. Um, if you have any other questions, you know, uh, feel free to pop them up right now into the chat. Other than that, I, I thank you for being a part of this evening's stream. Um, I'll stick around for a minute or two to answer any other questions. But other than that, uh, thank you for joining us. And if you enjoyed it, feel free to leave a comment. And if there's another topic you'd like to see or anything else that we can do to, to help you prepare for your AP exam, feel free to leave comments now. I'll stick around for a minute to answer any other questions. But aside from that, have a great night, everybody.